let's, let's start talking about composites. And uh, when you look at composites, if you open a book on composites, depending on the author, you're going to find that the author is going to classify composites in a different way, OK? Everybody has their own uh, different way of classifying composites. For example, people say, OK, uh, we can classify them by the type of the matrix. So you can have polymer matrix composites, metal matrix composites, ceramic matrix composites. Sometimes people say that they want to classify them by the type of reinforcement. They say, oh, it's going to be particle reinforced composites or continuous fiber reinforced composites. So you're going to find different ways of classifying materials. Uh, one example of a particle reinforced composite is this. These are magnets. Uh, this is uh, uh, some work we did uh, a few years ago where we were looking at the mechanical properties of magnets that were comprised by uh, uh, particles, which are, were magnetic particles out of these niodymium, iron, and boron compounds, and they were embedded in a polymeric matrix, OK? So this is an example of a polymer matrix composite. In this case, uh, uh, we have uh, platelets. And you can see the shape of the reinforcement. Or you can have these beautiful spheres OK, so these are two examples of particle reinforced composites or polymer matrix composites. Now, in this case, what we are interested are in the uh, magnetic properties of these materials. But even though the magnetic properties is the main objective, at the end of the day, they have to have good mechanical properties. If you cannot make a composite that will resist, for example, the vibration in an automobile or the, even the manufacturing processes, uh, nobody's going to use those, uh, those, those composites. So in most cases, we are concerned with the structural properties but there are many uh, functional applications, whether it is uh, magnetism or uh, piezoelectricity or uh, uh, thermoelectricity, where we would like the material to have a structural integrity and survive manufacturing and then uh, during service and operation. So those are examples of particle reinforced composites. And then in the other branch, we have fiber reinforced composites. And then you could have continuous fibers, OK? And those continuous fibers could be woven. And I'm going to show you some examples or non-woven, OK? And this is an example of a ceramic fiber reinforced ceramic matrix composite. What you have here are single fibers. You can see the fibers. These are silicon carbide fibers. These fibers have been woven into a fabric, OK? And that fabric has been infiltrated with a ceramic matrix, in this case, a silicon carbide matrix. Can you see the woven pattern? So these are all fibers that have been coated. You have fibers coming out of the plane of the, uh, of the screen. And then this solid piece is the matrix. This sample has been broken. And now we can see all the fibers pulling out of the, uh, pulling out of the, uh, out of the composite. So those are examples of continuous fibers. Uh, these are fibers that have very long aspect ratios. Again, you can have them woven as, or non-woven. And then you can also have these continuous fibers. And these fibers can be aligned or can be randomly distributed in the, uh, in the material. Now, this idea of composites is not new. People have been using composites for thousands of years, literally. Okay? So this is an example of adobe where you mix uh, 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 lodo con paja, OK? And that's a ceramic matrix composite, if you think about it, where the straws are the, uh, serving the role of uh, reinforcement. And then the moth is the uh, matrix. And even though these people didn't know much about fraction mechanics, they really understood that these uh, straws will provide a structural reinforcement to keep the cracks in the moth from opening up, OK? So those are things that people have been doing for 3,000 years. And these are composites. And today, that we have the theory we know uh, about uh, uh, crack bridging and uh, toughening. Uh, that's exactly what they were doing. And they, w they didn't know exactly the mathematics of uh, stress intensity factors and crack opening displacements. But you know, in reality, that's exactly what the uh, material was doing. Uh, the straws were providing a bridging mechanism to keep the cracks in the moth from opening and propagating. Okay. So we've been using composites for a very, very long time. And then more recently, this is an example of a chopped fiber, uh, where you have uh, glass fibers that are embedded in a, a polymeric matrix. Um, uh, in this case, it's going to be an epoxy. 
So let me show you a, a, a movie. Uh, and what you're going to see is a process where we have automated the manufacturing of uh, chopped fibers uh, uh, in a uh, polymeric matrix. We call this a P4 process. And uh, this is a technology that we have uh, uh, transferred to uh, uh, auto manufacturer. So let me, let me run this movie and let you see that one. So yesterday we were talking about transportation and ways to improve fuel efficiency in automobiles. And using composites is probably one of the best ways. Composites can be lightweight, can be strong. And two of the reasons why they have not been adopted more widely is number one, cost, okay? And number two, the time that it takes to process. So in this uh, little uh, movie, you saw those robotic arms. That still is too long. If you talk to people in the auto industry, if you cannot make the piece in 15 to 20 seconds, they are not going to be interested, okay? And this is one of the biggest challenges with composites. How can you make a piece like that that has fibers? The fibers have to be aligned in a certain way. You gotta consolidate, get the right shape, 15 seconds, because you have a, a line process that requires these things. Now, if you make this out of metal, it's very simple. You put a piece of metal, here comes a machine, boom, you stamp it, and then it goes. If you cannot do that with composites, people are not going to be interested. So, one of the big challenges working with composites is number one, getting the cost down, and I'm gonna show you some examples of the type of work that we are doing to reduce the cost of composites. But then most importantly, you gotta be able to make parts very quickly and be able to do that in a very reliable and reproducible way. So the, uh, the video uh, uh, show uh, an example of, uh, uh, of, car of, of glass fibers. Uh, these are the most uh, widely available fibers. There are different types of fibers. Uh, you have the uh, uh, A-glass uh, that contain, uh, uh, have a large content of alkali uh, uh, compounds, uh, and it just depends on the type of application that, uh, that you're gonna be using this. Uh, the electrical properties are not as good. So for example, if you wanna use this for insulation panels, you'll probably be looking at the uh, E-glass type of fibers. So if you see the transmission lines and you see these poles made out of composites for insulation, they're most likely going to have uh, e-glass uh, as, uh, as the reinforcement. If you have a structural application where you need a strength, you're probably gonna be looking at the S-glass type of fibers. These are probably uh, 50 uh, to 70% uh, stronger than e-glass. Uh, there are some uh, applications where uh, you really need uh, uh, dielectrical insulation more than uh, mechanical properties and then these uh, D-glass type of fibers are the ones that, uh, that are used. So there's a whole industry about uh, uh, glass fibers. There are many companies that make glass fibers. They are widely used. And again, uh, if you're gonna be making a boat, a canoe, uh, even some uh, low-cost tennis rackets, uh, uh, you're gonna be looking at the glass fibers, e even for automotive applications. You know, you, you can make the body panels in a car using glass fibers because they are fairly economical this is a high value product uh, and uh, this is one of the most uh, widely used. There are other types of fibers. Uh, there are the so-called aramid fibers. Uh, you probably have heard about Kevlar, okay? So if you look at military or uh, police protection, uh, all those uh, bulletproof uh, vests, they are made with uh, aramid fibers. Uh, they are very strong in tension. Their properties in compression are not as good. Uh, and, uh, but tensile properties are very good. And again, uh, they, they have found a uh, great application for uh, ballistic applications. That's where you find most of the uh, aramid fibers, the helmets for the, uh, for the military, 
vest for the police. People have used them in tires, uh, some aircraft uh, tires, they use uh, Kevlar as a reinforcement for the tires. And again, there's a whole uh, array of fibers. Uh, we have the Kevlar, you have e-glasses, glass, and then you can do a comparison, for example, by density. This is the density of glass fibers. Look at the density of carbon fibers, okay? Even the density of Kevlar. So whenever weight is important, you're gonna be, you're gonna start looking at your carbon fibers or your Kevlar fibers. So if you have a soldier and he's carrying 50 pounds and he's walking through the mountains, uh, you don't wanna give him a vest that's gonna weigh 20 pounds. So you're gonna be looking for lightweight materials. This is why Kevlar has been so uh, popular uh, with, the, uh, with the military. Jung's modules is the modules of elasticity and that gives you a comparison. This is what you get with glass. 70 to uh, 85 uh, uh, gigapascals of modulus. Look at carbon fiber. These are ultra stiff fibers, 500 GPA. This is very stiff, okay? What's, this, what, what's the modulus of a steel? 200, okay? 200 GPA, that's 30 million uh, PSI, 200 uh, GPA. So carbon fiber is at least twice as stiff as, uh, as a steel. Uh, Kevlar, 135. Then you have the strength in the GPA, okay? Look at this, uh, HS stands for high strength. So look at the strength, 5.6 GPA. HM stands for high modulus. This is why this fiber is stiffer. So it's a stiffer, but a little bit weaker than this. This is stronger, but not as stiff. And then something that most engineers care about is this uh, uh, normalized Values of strength and modules, it's what we call specific strength, where you divide the strength by the density or specific modules, modules by the density. And that's where carbon fibers really come ahead of pretty much uh, uh, everybody. And then we were talking about Weibull uh, theory. Obviously, the, the, the properties are going to depend on size. The smaller the diameter, the stronger the fiber. So in this case, you have fibers that range from 5 to 25 microns in diameter. And then the other thing that is important here is that the uh, maximum uh, temperature for utilization, in the case of glass, you can go up to 350 degrees C. Carbon uh, in the absence of oxygen can go up to 2,000 degrees C, 3,000 degrees C. If you have oxygen, you can probably go up to 600 with carbon. Uh, above that temperature starts to oxidize and lose its properties. With Kevlar, you can only go up to 250 degrees C, okay? And this is just a sampler. I mean, if you do a research on fibers, there are probably 200 types of fibers today. And we have silicon carbide fibers. And so you have the nickel on fibers, you have the tyranno fibers, uh, uh, you have the spectra fibers for ballistic applications. So this is just a, a, a brief uh, sampler of uh, available fibers. But these are the most important properties, modulus, strength, density, and they normalize these properties, uh, especially in applications where weight is going to be important. And that's the case of automobiles, okay? Whenever you're designing an automobile, weight is gonna be important. It's one of the things that we're trying to reduce to improve uh, fuel efficiency. So how can you buy fibers? And what type of uh, uh, shape and form do you get? Well, you can buy woven fabric, and it's not different from, from fabric. The fibers are woven in different patterns. You can have grid fabric, where you have fairly large opening. You have the toes of the fibers, but they're still woven with fairly large opening. You have hybrid fibers, where you combine carbon and Kevlar, for example. Uh, you have this continuous mat. That's what I show you for the uh, glass fiber structure that we were making for the automobile. You can buy fibers uh, in uh, 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 roving uh, where each uh, toe may have uh, between uh, 200 and 5,000 fibers. And then you have this more exotic type of structure. These are the 3D, uh, three-dimensional woven preform where you have fibers going in three directions, okay? But these are, these tend to be very expensive and you can only do these with fibers that are not very stiff. The stiffer the fiber, the more difficult it is to weave the fiber in the third direction. So these are examples of three dimensional fibers. So why don't we use carbon fibers? You know, carbon fibers are strong, stiff, lightweight, excellent properties. And the reason why we don't use fibers is that it takes a lot of energy and therefore it's very expensive to make carbon fiber. So let me show you some videos of uh, uh, the processes associated to make carbon fiber. So what I'm gonna show you first is a sequence of videos. It's a conventional process to make carbon fibers, okay? And I'm gonna show you some differences depending on the type of precursor that
that we use to make the fibers. said pan fiber. Did you hear about pan? Pan stands for polyacrylonitrile. It's, it's an organic compound. That's a precursor to the carbon fibers. So what do we get from that video? What's the first thing that comes uh, uh, to your attention when, when you look at that video? How much energy it takes to make these fibers? Okay, it's uh, several steps. You stabilize, you oxidize, you carbonize. So every time it's, it's a long step. So that takes a lot of energy. You gotta heat up those furnaces and there's a long residence time. Uh, um, the type of precursor that you use is very important. Uh, so making carbon fibers is not uh, trivial. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of time. This is why these fibers are so, uh, are so expensive. In this case, uh, they use a pan is, is one of the, uh, the precursors. There are many, many precursors. Um, there's one called rayon, rayon, which is what people use to make uh, carpets, alfombras. You can use other precursors to make carbon fibers. I want to show you one based on lignin which is actually a waste from the paper uh, uh, processing industry. And this is interesting because as I'm gonna show you, we have been able to make carbon fibers from lignin. Now, lignin was waste. So we knew about lignin and we approached companies that make paper and we told them, you know, you have all this lignin and you are just burning it, uh, could we have it? And when they realized that we wanted the lignin to make carbon fibers, it was no longer waste it became a commodity, so it became expensive. So, uh, and, and that's business, you know, it's a, 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 a lot of times, you know, we engineers said, oh, you know, we can take garbage and we can burn garbage to make energy. When people realize that you are using garbage for something, it's no longer garbage, you know, it's gonna have some value, you're gonna have to pay for it. So that's a, a, that's a, that's a capitalist uh, system. So let me show you the one for lignin. And this is very important because uh, you know, we, uh, we have been using high performance uh, fibers uh, for composites for many years, okay? We started using those uh, in the space program. Uh, if you look at military aircraft, we have used carbon fiber reinforced composites for many years. You look at your best tennis rackets, you look at your skis, uh, you look at the Formula One cars. I mean, we've been using in very niche kind of applications, carbon fibers for composites. So we approach General Motors, for Chrysler and we told them, you know, if you can start using composites in your automobiles, you're gonna reduce the weight. You don't have to sacrifice any safety. Uh, it's gonna cost you a little bit more, but uh, you reduce the weight by, you know, 20% and therefore you can use a smaller engine, everything that we talked about yesterday. And the uh, auto company said, well, how much is it gonna cost me? And you said, well, it's, it's gonna be probably, uh, you know, $10 a pound. I said, hell no. If you make them for $5 a pound, I'll buy them. 
So we went back to the drawing board and we changed precursors and we tried to optimize the process and we went down to $5 a pound. So we went back to the uh, auto manufacturer. So we had this, this an, uh, organization with four GM and Chrysler and said, okay guys, we have now fibers, $5 a pound. Are you guys interested? And they said, well, nah, it's not good enough. It's gotta be $3 a pound. So we go back five years into the drawing board and now we are making $3 a pound carbon fibers, and it still is not good enough. Uh, so the auto companies, you know, they play that game. The uh, margins in the auto industry are very small. And uh, you really have to show a significant advantage in terms of not just performance, but cost. You know, people like to pay a few cents up front. Even though you have better performance, sometimes the upfront cost is very important. So we've been playing that game with the auto industry. Now we are down to $3 a pound using this type of low cost uh, precursor. So let me show you the example of a uh, lignin. You see that black liquor, el licor negro, stinks. It's a, the uh, huele horrible. It's, a, it's one of the uh, stinkiest processes that you will ever find. But still has a lot of energy. So these companies, especially in the southeast part of the US, Georgia, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, there's a lot of uh, uh, pulp and paper industries, also in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington State. And they use that to produce uh, locally electricity. I mean, all this uh, black liquor has a lot of energy. So a lot of times they just burn it but it's really a waste. So that's what I was telling you. All this lignin was in the, in, in the black liquor. They were just burning it or just getting rid of it uh, uh, until they realized that, uh, that we could use that. So once you have the lignin filaments, you just take it through the process that we just saw. You carbonize, oxidize, stabilize, and then get your carbon fiber. So this is an example of how we, especially the chemical engineers, looking at all these processes, found opportunities to use what used to be waste to make carbon fibers. And by doing this, you can significantly reduce the price of the fibers and hopefully help them uh, uh, 
be introduced uh, into a commercial uh, application. Let's take a look at this one. And if you remember, we go back to the very first video. Once you take that, take it through the furnace, and then you have your carbon fibers, OK? Now, based on the conversation that we had yesterday, give me one reason for why we would not like to use pan precursors to make carbon fibers. Give me just one reason. That's one. Very good. Give me another one. Energy. It takes a lot of energy to make it. Okay, another one comes from oil, okay? So if you remember Gerald Ford, we gotta reduce our dependence on oil. The price of oil goes to $140 a, a barrel. We are fighting with the uh, oil manufacturers to make $3 a pound of carbon fiber. As soon as the price of oil goes to the roof, then it just becomes impossible. So this is the challenge where chemical engineering uh, comes into the, uh, into the picture, looking at potential alternative precursors that used to be waste and now we use that as an alternative to reduce our dependence on oil. So this is a way in which we reduce our dependence on oil. And obviously, you know, CO2, these are very energy intensive processes. One of the big challenges that we have is can we make these fibers in a different way so we don't have to spend that much energy? Because the carbon footprint just to make the fibers is just astronomical. Uh, and then the uh, dependence on the, uh, on the precursor. Uh, so, so these are, you know, this is a constant, uh, uh, this is a constant challenge. Uh, and, and this is something that you're going to find in your, uh, in your professional career. You know, 80% is going to be thought process, chemistry, chemical reactions, mechanical behavior. And then the other part, the one that may end up dominating is, is, is just cost. How do we look at cost? Can we look at alternative processes? Uh, we are always competing. There's going to be a market for things. Uh, uh, things that people like to do is find multiple applications of either the precursor or the final product, because once you find fin multiple applications, you can increase volume and then reduce your cost. But so that's going to be a constant challenge. So as engineers, you know, it's uh, uh, sometimes we don't get training in school. Uh, we uh, end up learning these things once we are in the uh, in the workplace. But that's really a reality. You know, the cost of technologies, the cost of introducing technologies, is one of the one of the most important uh, uh, elements 
that we're going to uh, have to take into, into consideration.